I've been an avid fisherman my whole life, ever since I was old enough to hold my first pole. I've caught a lot of fish over the years, probably enough to fill a house. And of all those fish, the one that stands out the most is the largemouth bass. Welcome to Lost Creek Nature Retreat. I'm Andrew Hirsch. Join me as I tell the story of the life cycle of the largemouth bass. Native to eastern North America, not only is it one of America's most popular freshwater game fish and responsible for a multi-billion dollar fishing industry, but it is also considered a keystone species as a top predator in the food web of our ponds, rivers, and lakes. As sunny spring days warm the surface of the pond, fish are drawn from the deep water into the shallows and coves to soak up the warmth. Dozens of bass from the size of this lunker female down to the smaller males congregate to bask in the warm water. They've been in a semi-dormant state under the ice all winter and are now in the process of bringing their body temperatures up in preparation for pre-spawn feeding. This behavior provides an excellent opportunity to do a count and determine the bass population of the pond. Pound for pound, largemouth bass are one of the hardest fighting freshwater fish, which makes them a favorite target for anglers of all ages. Their aggressive nature makes for exciting strikes, both on the surface and below. Once hooked, they can be a challenge to land as they jump out of the water to spit the hook, or dive into the weed beds or under sunken trees to break free. Like their smaller cousin, the smallmouth bass, they put up a great fight, but both tire fast in comparison to long-winded fighters such as catfish or pike. When the water temperature reaches a steady 60 degrees, male bass will begin searching for the right spot to build a nest. They seek out sunny areas near stumps, submerged logs, or other cover that provides protection from predators. At this point, their main focus is on nest building, so they pretty much stop feeding. After the nest site is selected, the male will use its fins to sweep away the silt and debris to clear an area for spawning. When the nest is ready, it's time to lure in the females. It's not long before he attracts the attention of his first female. She knows a great location when she sees it. When she enters the nest, they roll together as she deposits the eggs while he fertilizes them with his sperm. A second female can be seen joining up with her as she departs the nest. Earlier, I observed both females spawning together in the nest at the same time, but was unable to film it. It is not uncommon for several females to lay eggs in the same nest. They will also lay eggs in the nest of other males, so as not to, shall we say, put all their eggs in one basket. After the eggs are laid and fertilized, the male takes up guard duty. He swims back and forth, protecting against any potential egg thieves. The eggs will take two to ten days to hatch, depending on water temperature and quality. The warmer and clearer the water, the faster they hatch. He uses his fins to fan the eggs, providing them with fresh oxygenated water and clearing away any silt. Females can lay thousands of eggs, so it's a big responsibility.
Contrary to popular belief, the male isn't always alone with his guard duties. Some females will stay with the nest until the eggs hatch, at which time the male is then on his own. Here we see the female in deeper water, patrolling the outer perimeter, while the male stays in close, tending the nest. Bass guarding the nest are extremely aggressive and will strike at anything that swims, slithers, or crawls near the nest, making them susceptible to the fisherman's lure. It is very tempting to take advantage of this aggressive behavior, especially when it provides the opportunity to land a big lunker. But there are opposing views as to whether or not bass should be caught while on the nest. With catch and release, when the fish is promptly released near the nest site, they will usually make their way back to the nest quickly. But any time the nest is left unattended, it is exposed to predation. If there are a lot of bluegills or predators close by, they could wipe out a nest in minutes. Bottom line is, as with everything else, the key is moderation. Too much pressure can result in decreased populations. So be respectful. Give the bass a chance to do their thing, and there will be plenty of catching to go around. It looks like a good hatch, as we see thousands of newly hatched fry forming a dizzying school. After their egg sacs have been used up, they leave the nest and move into open water to begin feeding on zooplankton, tiny insects, and small crustaceans. The timing of the hatch coincides nicely with new growth of aquatic vegetation, providing them cover as they forage for food. The female has headed off to feed and replenish herself after the arduous task of egg laying. The male must continue his fast as he maintains vigilance over his newly hatched family. He swims back and forth, corralling the fry close to shore where he can protect them. By this time, the males are so ravenous, sometimes they can no longer hold off and have been known to eat some of their own spawn. Here you can see the smorgasbord of food blowing by on the surface, offering the fry a limitless banquet to feast on. They grow fast and will eat anything they can fit in their mouth. This whirligig water beetle is doing some surface feeding itself, and while it may be too big for the tiny fry to fit in their mouths, it's still worth a good chase. Sometimes, they even try to eat something that is too big to fit in their mouth. I found these two fingerlings in the spillway screen, and it goes to show you just how much of a glutton largemouth bass can be. 
After approximately two weeks, the fry will be left on their own, and the male will finally head out to feed. At this time, they will be preyed upon by a variety of creatures, like this great blue heron. It specializes in snatching small fish, and is more than happy to make a snack of the bite-sized morsels. or this sleek and stealthy northern water snake, who in its younger days might have been a meal for a large bass, but has now turned the tide and is looking to make a meal of them. Bass are ambush predators and will often suspend under or near stumps, logs, or man-made structures as they wait for prey to come by, and will strike it both above and below the surface. Good thing this turtle is too big to fit in its mouth. This dragonfly is a prime target as it dips its abdomen into the water to deposit its eggs. Bass are known for their ability to jump out of the water to catch flying insects and even the occasional bird. One of my wife and I's favorite pastimes is sitting by the pond watching the bass jump. We use a grading system from 1 to 10 to rate the bass on their jumps. Points are awarded for style, difficulty, and accuracy. If the fish completely leaves the water, it gets points for difficulty. If it does a flip while in the air, it gets points for style. And if it catches the bug, it gets points for accuracy. A fish that jumps completely out of the water and does a flip as it catches the bug gets a perfect 10. Any bugs that are unfortunate enough to fall into the water make easy targets and don't last long. Yeah. Meet Felix and Oscar, our pet bass. These two bass have set up shop in the wooden crib channel that connects our two ponds. Defying the normal bass tendency to be territorial, they have teamed up to form a gauntlet and ambush anything that the current brings to them. Could they be a mated pair? If so, there may be a previously undocumented behavior for the species. Let me know if any of you have ever seen this type of behavior before. One of their favorite prey is frogs. 
They simply can't resist the tender little morsels. Bass use their huge mouths to create a vacuum and suck their prey in. Oscar rarely misses, but when he does, Felix is there to finish the job. It's great fun to feed them, and we toss in any crickets, grubs, or worms we find. Minnows are also a favorite on the bass menu. This is where the keystone species comes into play. Minnows eat zooplankton, which feed on phytoplankton or microalgae. Without the presence of bass to limit the minnow population, they will overpopulate and consume all the zooplankton, resulting in algae blooms. Too much algae can be detrimental to an aquatic ecosystem as it uses up oxygen, resulting in fish kills. Oh, he's a beauty. Look at him. Woo! Gonna jump one more time, maybe. Oh, 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 there he is. Oh, wow. Look at the size of this guy. I think it's the same one that swam by earlier. Nope. That same ambush behavior that serves the bass so well can also turn out to be a deadly hazard. Especially when you're being watched by a sharp-eyed osprey in the trees that can swoop down and snatch you from the water. Bass in cooler climates tend to live longer and can live up to 15 to 20 years, but generally 10 years is an old timer. This is what a really old bass looks like. They get a blocky shape with a hump-like dorsal bulge and a distorted overhung jaw. The eyes begin to look cartoonish and will often cloud over, causing blindness. First snow signals winter is on the way. As temperatures drop, the bass head for deeper water in preparation for the long winter. Their metabolism slows down, requiring less food. All is not lost though. As ponds and lakes freeze over, a new opportunity presents itself. On Hirsch Pond, the big bass have been caught so many times they have wised up and are difficult to catch during the summer. Ice fishing is another story. The best time to catch the big lunkers is through the ice.
ice fishing was so good, even my wife Holly got in on the action. This bass was caught under the ice, telling me that this wound was not caused by a heron. Based on the curve of the wound, it must be a bite from a very large fish, and the severity of the gash makes me think teeth. We do have chain pickerel in the pond, but I didn't think there was one in there that big. I was pretty sure it was a pickerel until I spotted this otter chowing down on a bluegill it caught under the ice. Could this be the culprit?